I am very excited for this session that we're gonna be talking about security with two security professionals from our internal IT org. Um, so I'm very happy to have Josh Van Hoos. I'm Josh Van Hoos. I am a staff engineer and the security architect for SolarWinds. I've been in security for almost 13 years. And of course, Noel Barbie is gonna cover our operation side. Hi, how you doing? My name is Noel Barbie. I'm head of global end user services here at SolarWinds. I've been here about five years and have about almost 18 years of experience running IT operations. A lot of experience in this room. And I, of course, am just a security enthusiast and I'm here to learn with all of you about what our security teams do. Um, so today we're gonna get started a little bit of talking about kind of what is the basics of security and then we're gonna get into how we go about implementing these things across a global organization. So I come from a background of very small teams from various organizations. So I understand a lot of times you're not gonna have the staffing that you need to implement the most brand new tech or the, the most advanced security controls. So where you should start as an organization is really about the business. Um, a lot of my friends that are in security have business degrees alongside those. It's extremely helpful. Knowing your business is always where you should start with security because no one's gonna know what weird looks like like your own business teams are gonna be. I like that. No one knows what weird looks like. <laughs> um, I think that that's a salient point for like any department really is you should always focus on what the business needs are. So if you can understand business needs first, like that's the better place to start for anything that you're doing. Absolutely. And once you kind of understand your business needs, your next big step is really going to be compliance frameworks. If there is a business out there, there's probably a security framework to go with it. Um, you're going to be thinking of things like NIST, ISO, um, PCI, they're going to provide frameworks for your compliance needs. Start there. It's great to secure everything and that's what we all want to do, but in reality we have to make money. And those frameworks are built for your industry to continue to make money while being secure. So let's get back to the basics of kind of the security organization. First of all, what is a blue team and what do they do? Blue teams are going to be your traditional defenders. Most blue teams in, in various size organizations are going to start with your SOC, and it's a security operations center. That can come in a lot of different flavors. If you're a smaller org and you only have one person, they are your entire SOC. So they are responsible for making sure that your um, endpoint protection is in place and that you're receiving logs from all of your business critical applications so that you know when events happen, so you can find where that weird is. Yes. So that's traditionally where you'll start. And then from there, what you'll see is a progression across several different teams. You'll see your SOC has kind of stood up, you have visibility. Your next is gonna be vulnerability management. You need to make sure things are being patched appropriately and on time. You can generally make that work with a lot of different tools. You don't have to have a vulnerability management scanner to do that. If you're doing your patches and you see one fails, go check it out. Go check out if it has a vulnerability attached to it and it can help you reprioritize that. After vulnerability management, you're gonna see things like cloud security. And then on the blue side, you really see it kind of end with an incident response team. Okay. You'll see very mature organizations have a very well-established internal incident response system. Excellent. Well, that moves us straight on to the other side of things, which would be what is a red team and uh, what exactly do they do? So red teaming, personal opinion, it's a lot of fun. Um, if you like puzzles, this is your, your gig. Uh, so what red teams tend to do is use very crafted tools, techniques, and procedures called TTPs to test systems out and see where vulnerabilities might land. Vulnerabilities, everyone always thinks of a technical vulnerability. Oh, this piece of software wasn't updated. A lot of vulnerabilities land in business process and procedures. So if I can exploit a vulnerability in your process, generally you're not going to have an alert go off for that. No one's going to know until it's already too late. Red teamers are going to look for those types of things. Um, past that, inside the same family of offensive security, you'd have application testers. This is another really tuned expertise within security. A lot of times what you'll have them do is stand up your own applications, like we do here in SolarWinds, and do vulnerability scans, workflow tests, 
abuse case tests, they really, you have to think like a bad guy to do those jobs because not everyone is gonna, most people will read a sign and say, I'm gonna do just that. You need someone that's gonna read the sign and go, maybe not. Yeah. And that, that's really your red team side of things. Well, then that brings us to kind of how those two teams work together. And then we get to ask Noel about the operational side of things oh, yeah. on how they work with security. So, so talk to me about how the red team and the blue team work together. Red teams and blue teams need to be very close, but they need to have a pretty solid barrier between them, honestly. A lot of times when a blue team will find out the red team's gonna do an engagement, they're on high alert mm. and they're on their toes and they wanna watch everything. That's not reality. Reality is, is we're humans, we're gonna get a little complacent. You want that layer of surprise with it. But at the same time, the red team's findings are gonna directly feed into the blue team work. So you're gonna have a bit of a cyclical pattern. Mm -hmm. Anything the red team can do, the blue team needs to go out, build alerts around it, tune up business processes, and really dig into how you can see this happening outside of the normal workflow. So very close together. And to kind of hand this off to Noel, we don't deploy these things. Yeah. We consult, we advise, we alert and monitor, but I don't have admin, nor do I want it. And we need IT to be able to go out and deploy these things so that we can do our jobs. So usually um, Josh and his brilliant team will introduce to end user services and IT operations team what needs to be implemented. And we'll have a conversation. Um, with the different solutions, what usually happens, we first kind of assess the situation. Hey, can we install YubiKeys on all systems? Can we roll out MFA? Was some of the risk of doing that was some of the limitations? Um, and so we you know, list those all out. Um, and after we come up with the solution, what we usually do is create a test plan for a small number of user dash admins to really test out the technology on Josh and his team's behalf. And once that's um, considered done, uh, we'll come up with a rollout plan to um, advance the solution to, you know, different departments, different organizations, depending on what the technology is. It, it doesn't end there either. The security team actually picks up after that point. Everything's rolled out, everything is there, but is it actually working the way we think it is? Red teams often will go back in at the end of an engagement or a rollout and start to really validate and prove out that these controls work and these defenses work. Yeah, and take YubiKeys for example, and there was a huge effort just with both our teams part, but there was a lot of challenges. For example, we have um, contractors that's in Ukraine. how we're going to get YubiKeys to folks in these remote regions where it's really hard to give them YubiKeys. Um, there was a campaign effort to introduce what YubiKeys are. The marketing teams, the finance teams don't know what YubiKeys are and to have a campaign to really express why we're doing what we're doing. And not just to secure the environment, um, but also sell the fact that it's more convenient for them to use these higher end technologies. Well, now I want to bring us back around to something you said earlier, which was that you don't have admin rights, nor do you want them. Mm -hmm. I know that um, oftentimes, especially in IT, and no shade to anybody out there, this is kind of a thing we do, right? Security feels like it can get in the way of getting our job done. So um, talk to me a little bit about why you feel that way. So I'm going to split that into two. Okay. One is going to be the, dash, the admin conversation. I don't want to be an administrator because the primary role of a security professional is to worry about risk. If I have admin, I become a risk. Mm. If I can reduce my own risk footprint, always looking for a way to do it. Mm. The other reason why I don't need to have admin is you have checks and balances. The person reviewing work should not be the person doing the work. Mm. IT does the work, we review it for security. If you have the checker being the checkee, it doesn't, there's no balance there. You, it's really easy to make mistakes. It's easy to move fast and go, oh, I'll come back to it. So we really try to keep those separate. Yeah. The other part of that is security as a roadblock. I personally and my CISO personally have really tried to change that view here at SolarWinds. And I've kind of become famous for being known as, I'm not gonna tell you no, I'm gonna tell you not like that. So that we can increase our security posture and reduce, reduce risk. I like that a lot. 
I'm not gonna say no, but not like that. That's really good. That's really good. I'm gonna take that away. For, for, for my team who are admins, right, we don't give Dash admin access 24 hours a day, right? They log in, they sign in to get those elevated rights. And at the end of the day or after a four hour shift, I mean, those um, rights are, are, are void because it, it reached the time limit. So um, the, the, the good old days where there's Dash admin have access to everything 24 by seven it leaves you open to a lot of vulnerabilities and security attacks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you brought up the admin, the admin by request is what we use, right? right? And uh, I've used it and I think it's a really intuitive process. It does not take very long. Our IT department is very responsive and you only get temporary admin access. Just usually I've used it to like install OBS or something else that I need, right? I need to record my screen for a demo. I've got to do an upgrade. I need admin rights temporarily and it'll be for like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. It doesn't even need to be all day. I mean, there are certain things that you would need it for, but you have to give all of that reasoning in there of like why you need the admin rights. Correct. Um, and I think that's a that's a great way to be. Yeah, I wish I could be at the Four Seasons 24 by seven, but they're <laughs> gonna kick me out after checkout time. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. So no, earlier you brought up um, something that we do as an IT department is to try to try and like minimize the impact it has on users. And one of the things that you didn't quite mention, but you sort of hinted around is that we kind of are personalized the messaging that goes out to individual departments and regions, right? We have uh, where it comes from a person and not just the regular IT department, right? It comes Correct. from someone you're more likely to know, like someone from the Austin office is gonna email the Austin office Correct. to say you need to do something. Yeah, and, and sometimes that's not good enough just to send out a blanket email to the whole company and that's why we want to personalize um, those communications and we even go a step further um, creating actually meeting invites and Microsoft Teams to let people know or different units know exactly what's going on if they have any questions or answers regarding the new technology changes um, for example if we are limiting USB ports for people to plug in their USB drives um, there should be a conversation about it a live conversation um, email is just not good enough yeah we have to do that to cover our basis. Hey, we did communicate it, but we take a, a, um, a further step to actually meet with the business users, meet with the geographies, um, and with everybody who's being impacted with that. It's, you know, you, you layer the communications just like you layer security or even operations, yeah. right? You have those fallback plans and those layers of it. And we'll have silly campaigns, right? We'll have posters up. There's, you know, post, um, we have digital signage all over SolarWinds that we post advertisement up. We might express it during um, all hand meetings or even meetings that's not even related to what we're rolling out um, just to get the word out. And it's, it's more stickier than just sending a, a, just a generic email. It's not generic, but a targeted email. Yeah, that's just from the IT department. Yeah, right the there. IT department, I, we're I, going I to take everything that. away. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, I think that what it does is it really humanizes right. IT, especially for other departments. Like within IT, you know, you know the guy working next to you and they can just, you know, lean over the cube yeah. and tell you you need to go implement this thing or whatever. But like a lot of other departments are affected. I mean, we've got sales and finance and HR and uh, marketing and all kinds of other things at a company this size. And even at a smaller company, even if you're a one man IT person, you still have a other people that are relying on you and that use the technology in your company. Right. So humanizing it in any way is the smart way to go because especially if they're in a non-technical role, right. they want to talk to a human being and not a faceless void. Yeah, yeah. So I see a lot of larger, not so much smaller organizations, but larger organizations really behind, behind that brand IT, mm -hmm. but never put themselves out. Hey, this is the person who designed the solution. This, this is the person who's implemented the solution. If you have any questions, you have any issues, come to us directly, right? So we tried to personalize it, like you said, and put a face to who IT is, so it's less scary. So I know for a lot of people in IT, you, the personalities that are there a lot of times are more introverted or they just want to, you know, head down, get their job done and get out for the day. And so it can be a big leap to make yourself a little bit more vulnerable to that communication. But communication is so important. And as a as a person who's been on the receiving end of the our our help desk and the, the uh, and the virtual tech bar and like all of these other things, I, I have appreciated the humanization efforts that we've undergone in the last couple of years right? You guys have put a lot of effort into making it an uh, easier interaction, right? Which means that people are more likely to go do those things. Yeah. And, and it, you know, as communication goes, when we give advanced notice, it also 
increase the adoption of the new technology we roll out. We could do, you know, all sorts of different communications in person, virtual tech bar, as you mentioned, um, different brown back sessions, um, but give folks a chance to really absorb what's happening, um, let them reflect, let them ask questions, then have a realistic timeline to roll out these different technologies, because I've seen smaller companies too, hey, we want to roll this out immediately, and it's really detrimental to their, the operations of the company if you're rolling out something way too fast. I have done that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, of my, one of my earlier roles in security, I went to this, the CEO of where I worked, and I said, everyone here is an administrator, I want to take it away. He said, do it. Monday morning, we woke up, I had taken away local administrator from every user in the company, and I was on a phone for the rest of the day. Yeah. Troubleshooting my users' issues, because I was a one-man IT shop at the time, so. Yeah, and so that's why usually, no, we'll give that advance notice, but when we do execute the implementation of a new technology, we do it at phases at, at times, not like a big bang approach, right? Um, could we roll out YubiKeys and, and, and enforce all these new technologies that we rolled out here at SolarWinds in the past two years in a week? Yeah, absolutely. Is that right for the business? Probably not, right? Um, for example, we don't want to um, route major security initiatives um, during the you know, end of a quarter where that affects the sales teams, right? And so we have to be cognizant of what the business needs. You can secure the business, but it's still a business. It's still organizations that has to run and we don't want to cripple or handicap um, their operations. Yeah. And with software development in particular, the number one rule with, with development security is be dis don't be disruptive. Mm. Your developers, not fans of change. So you really need to be gentle with them as you roll these out. Give, give buffer time between giant changes. Um, and we're, we're right in the middle of that right now of kind of being a little hands off with them and letting them get to work. And, and you said about change, we have a, you know, a, all, I suggest that all IT organizations have a robust change advisory board. Absolutely. That, you know, you know when we, we schedule something on the calendar and we bring all the stakeholders in to let them know what's being changed and there's an approval process and there's notification that goes out, um, that process needs to be formalized if we're making huge production changes to an environment. So having that change advisory board, um, I know our very own RJ runs that. <laughs> and and security, security should be as big of a part of a conversation right. with that as operations. From the beginning. Yeah, from, from, the beginning. from the beginning. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that um, those overnight changes, even if it's a small, you think it's a smaller change. Yeah. You don't know the it's full impact. It's click a impact. button. It really, yeah. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> done. Yeah. You, you might think it's a smaller change, but doing an overnight change without communication, without that phased approach like right. you talked about, is way more interruptive and disruptive than you might think it is because you don't work on those systems day to day. So you don't really know how it's going to impact their daily work. So taking that like phased approach, I mean, I've noticed the changes around here. I think that it's a smarter way to go. I, I do like that you brought up process being so important as well. I think that process is really important. And a lot of times in smaller companies, if they're, especially if they're not like well established or kind of newer or within the first few years, they haven't um, gotten to a point where they've had established processes. And it can be difficult to, um, to have that laid down where like you think about it as it's happening instead of making that plan ahead of time. And then you have to make your plans after the fact Correct. so that the next time around, you're not so reactive. And we're always learning too. We're not what we want to be. And that's why I love by working here. And you should be always continuing to improve your processes, your change advisory board. There's, you know, we're looking at dashboards and hey, did you fill out this particular form, right? Oh, how come you didn't check this box, right? Um, and so we're always evaluating what we're doing, what we're doing and how we can make it better. And you can really do that from the security perspective too. One man teams, three man teams, 25 man teams, doesn't really matter. Um, there are plenty of open source tools that you can do a lot of these security activities yourself. It's gonna be a little clunkier than your enterprise tools, obviously, but you can get the job done. Yeah. Um, phishing is a great example of, earlier in my career, I was using open source tools to do phishing campaigns. Now, while I was here, I was able to use some nicer tools for these activities, but that was, that was a really fun part of the job even early on, is I didn't need these high-tech tools to go out and be creative and send out phishing emails to see if my users would click on them. 
I like that uh, there's a creative aspect to that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You get to have a little fun with those phishing emails and smishing and all of these other different various ways of trying to do social engineering, right? Where you're trying to see if people are learning, right? And I think it's a really important part of security from a user perspective is so you're kept on your toes, right? You're, you're constantly checking because, you know, it's very easy to get lost in the in the day to day. You know, I'm just checking emails and that looks legit, but maybe it's not. You don't you don't necessarily check. I think user negligence is like a huge problem. That's, that's what I'm calling it. Um, the number one rule I tell people with phishing, um, and I tell my family this, is uh, don't click the email. If you got an email from Amazon saying, "Hey, you've got go a sign into 25, Amazon. Mm -hmm. go sign into Amazon," that's the number one thing I tell people. If you're if you're don't even think about it. Yeah. Don't go, oh, is this header cor correct? Is this link looking good? Is this, why? Why put yourself through that stress? Just go to Amazon and check. Yeah. You got a, a call from your bank? Go call go your call bank back. back. Call them back. <laughs> don't yeah. click on that URL. Don't, yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't give them any information, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. I do that a lot. You know, as I like to say, I'm a security enthusiast. I'm not a security expert. Mm. But I, uh, I make <laughs> it a, like a priority of mine to I try and educate at least the people in my life, like my mom and, and you know my dad that are like older and uh, especially th those are older, they're more prone to falling for those schemes, right? Like it's, it's prevalent, especially, right? Like they will check their email. The Amazon one gets people all the time, all the time, common phishing email. And it's just like, well, okay, well, at least call me first and then I'll, I'll tell you what to look for. Um, so I think it's really important that those campaigns still happen because it keeps you on your toes, right? Even if even if you didn't catch it, then you'll get a notification that you didn't catch it and here's here's where you should have seen so that they, you can continue learning. Just like the camp, always continue learning. <laughs> You mentioned earlier open source tools. So like what is the like good, better, best journey for someone who maybe maybe you can afford the top notch security tools and implementation tools for operation side as well. And maybe you can't. Like what does that look like across the board? So you always you always scale your solutions with your business. Mm -hmm. If you are a small scale company, you've got 25 employees, you're gonna be able to do some some really direct solutions that are gonna give huge payoffs on your risk profile, on your risk posture. The number one thing that I cannot stress more is implement MFA. Doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter if it's an app, doesn't matter if it's a text code, yeah. doesn't matter if it's your YubiKey, that is such a huge step in stopping an attacker. Um, there are ways to get around most of the things I just said, like the, uh, the SMS sniffing, that's gonna get rid of your text code. Uh, application, you know, if your phone's compromised, you're getting a push notification, that can be a problem. But all of that is gonna be better than basic authentication. Um, as far as open source tooling, kind of how that journey goes is you, you generally will see new, new phases of technology. So I wanna go from I have just endpoint detection to I wanna do vulnerability management. Okay, well, dabble in the open source first see if it's gonna be what is actually what you're actually looking for. And then if you can implement a process around it, keep going with the open source tool. Most of those tools are pretty well up, kept up with by the vendor. Some vendors even offer a free version of their enterprise tool that you can just go out, out of the box and use. So a lot of times when people are like, oh, I can't afford that, there's a version of it out there that you can. Um, same thing with phishing, there are platforms like GoFish, um, from a vulnerability standpoint, there are scanners and, and things like Nessus that you can go out and, and really quickly set up and knock out some vulnerability information from. So open source is not all bad. Uh, a lot of people, whenever you get into a large enterprise, they really don't like that sound. They're like, oh, I want, it, I want it to be licensed, the legal's gotta be happy, this is gonna be happy. That's true. None of those are, are wrong, but to show the proof of concept and the validity of the solution, open source will generally help out. What about from an operations perspective? How do you guys go about choosing your vendors? Like, like you mentioned earlier, the YubiKey rollout. Like, how did you land on YubiKey versus something else? We'll do our own research, like Josh said, right? Um, we'll go to the Gartner, uh, who, who's the best in business for that different technology, go to the, the Gartner Magic Quadrant, mm -hmm. and really do some self-researching. Um, but we'll present our solutions and our ideas to Josh's team to see if it's a viable, secure solution before we start 
um, designing anything, right? So um, yeah, we, we, so a lot of the times we're picking our own solutions, um, but we're definitely getting back in from security sp perspective to make sure, hey, is this a sound solution? You know, how, how they do the upgrades and stuff like that. So um, yeah, we do a lot of our backend research, but we definitely bring security team to kind of validate um, we can use it. It goes back to that collaboration between the two teams, right? Security from the first, like always be considering it in your project. So that's that's great. You know, you, you do have to do research, right? There's so many tools out there that you could be using for literally anything. There's so much technology. And a lot of times you'll see it comes down to the implementation. I can have the most advanced lock on the planet, but if my key is straight smooth, what does it really do? Mm -hmm. Nothing. So a lot of times it comes down to the implementation. IT may pick a tool and say, this is the best in brand out there. Well, that's awesome. How are we gonna set it up? And that's where my team's gonna be a little bit more involved. They're gonna wanna see the exact policies, the exact configurations, the network segments that the tools will be touching to ensure that they're configured correctly. Um, just this morning, I did a review for a business server and the number one concern was network visibility. So that's the number one thing I focused in on for the configuration. I was in a meeting about password management, right? And a lot of the solutions does the same thing. And so sometimes it really comes down to how easy it is to implement and costs as well too. Yeah. Um, and so even though there are some solutions that to do totally different things, there are solutions that do very similar things and kind of have to parse out the little details mm -hmm. and picking the right solution for your needs. Well, it sounds like it goes right with that business need of like, yeah, like it could be the best in the world, but if the cost is out of range for your business, then you can't consider it anyway. So you need to be looking at other things so that you can meet the needs of your business while also staying on budget. Because yeah. while no one wants to care about the budget numbers, we do kind of also have to care about the budget numbers. Correct. I make jokes really often that uh, I don't make money. I spend money. <laughs> Developers make money. Um, marketing makes money. Sales, Sales makes money. money. I can't stand in their way. And you know, throughout this conversation, we've come back to the business need, the business. At the end of the day, that's what this is about, is you are, we are all here to support the business, not the other way around. Yeah. A lot of times you'll see people, especially early on in a security career, wanna lock everything down. They lock it down to the point that's not usable. Yeah. And we're here to enable the business to make money in the most secure way they can. And that's what I really would want to tell any up and coming security professional is focus on your business, focus on what's important to your business and securing that. And as we invest in the business from a security standpoint, right, we listen to the business and you build that fortress around the business to protect it. Um, we're protecting the people that's inside of it and the weakest link of all security are the people, mm -hmm. right? And so we need to invest in people with education, um, different trainings, different Culture um, culture yeah. on, on why we're doing what we're doing. Because you could build the biggest fortress around a company. It just takes one, one person, person. To so, open the door. As we to walk someone in. Walk come someone in. in. Come yeah. On, come on in. Come to the party, right? And so, um, and so there's a balance there as well, too. Yeah, as you're focusing on the technologies, we're focusing on the people aspect um, to make sure they are carrying, um, implementing, or executing the best business practice we put in front of them. So we've talked a lot about implementation. We've talked about um, you know process documentation. We've talked about all the different ways that the two teams kind of work together to make sure that the security gets rolled out. And you mentioned earlier that it's a phased approach, which means to me that strategy, especially like longer term strategy, is really important aspect of all this. So talk to me a little bit about what it goes into like making a plan for a rollout. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've deployed a lot of solutions at Solar Ones, but we don't do it in a vacuum. We don't do it because there's a need or it's cool. It's really part of a one, three, five year plan that's been set by our executives, our leaders, um, with our influence and for our opinions, by the way, um, from the offset. So, for example, we're at best, excuse me, um, a better, best, or good, better, best, good, better, best plan on uh, becoming passwordless, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that takes literally years of foundations. Hey, first, like you said earlier in the conversation, we need to um, deploy MFA to everyone. Yep. Then there's hardware tokens. And then what's next and what's next? Um, and so that doesn't happen overnight. That's years in the making. Um, and so you have to have a high vision on 
what you want, right? What's the end goal? And work your way backwards with that. And, and from our side, you, if you work in security, you need to be patient. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna see returns immediately, hardly ever especially when it comes to what we were talking about with culture. It takes time to bake that in and have it ingrained in an organization. But not even that, um, rolling out a new to EDR solution or endpoint detection and response solution, that takes time. Um, tuning those policies takes time because there are gonna be instances that you're not planning for that could be complete roadblocks for your users. You have to adapt to those. Doing the big switch off, like I admitted earlier, not the best way to go about it because you're gonna spend a lot of time troubleshooting. You're spending a lot of time re-enabling the business. And, and time ramping up our technicians, our engineers to learn the technology yeah. to implement it. We don't know everything, right? <laughs> and so when new technology, yeah, we don't know everything. Ah! So when new technologies do come out, we have to send our team to training on top of training, um, learn from different companies how they rolled out their, yeah. their products and, and solutions. So it does take time and that's why um, it is a three, five year roadmap. In security, another thing that you'll see that is very time consuming is the volume. If you are mid-journey in rolling out your vulnerability management program, and you're starting to see thousands, tens of thousands oh. of vulnerabilities roll into your, your environment, it takes time to chew through that. Half of those are that's probably why I'm false problems. That's why I'm in IT operations. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's truth. <laughs> But what, what you find is as you mature your department, as you mature your practices, you either onboard staff, understand business processes that drop that volume down a significant amount. And again, that, that takes time to chew through. Yeah. Um, something that I see in, in some of my peers and some other organizations is burnout. The volume is so high that they think they're gonna tackle it for 12 hours a day every day. And what you end up happening is you end up in the hospital because you've been working oh, too much. Yeah. That's a real story. It's Not real. about me, but that's a real it's story. Real. It's real. You have to give your people time to digest what's going on. Yeah. And that has to be factored into your plan. And I think we do a really good job with, oh, yeah. with that. You know, once we finish a huge initiative, yeah. there is a breathing room for Got to. Yeah. two days. No, no more than, <laughs> it's more like two weeks. Like, no, like there, there has to be breathing room because you know, we've been pressing the team so hard to meet these goals. So, yeah, yeah. That, that comes into factor. I feel like we could talk about burnout a lot, but we're, that's a whole other oh, conversation. Fair, whole fair. other conversation. Is that the wellness department? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. I think um, I think what what you're all get, what you're getting at here is like, make a plan, but be adaptable. Adaptability is super important. You have to be iterative sometimes because things are going to change. New threats are going to come out that you can't possibly be prepared for because you don't think it's going to happen. So you have to be prepared to kind of adapt to the things that are happening around you, just like everywhere else in IT. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and talking to our THWAC camp attendants um, about security. I think it's been really humanizing having real people come here and talk to us about the different aspects. Not of, AI. Real. <laughs> not, not, not AI. Real, real uh, in flesh and blood. To the different aspects of security and um, kind of making it uh, real in, in a way, right? Like it's not just the, again, that faceless void. You had real people talking about real problems and how you guys work in it every day. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Crystal.